Well, welcome to um, one of a series of, of powerful owl videos that BirdLife Australia is putting together. Uh, we'll ha be having a whole host of, of experts talking about a variety of subjects um, regarding the Powerful Owl Project and nocturnal wildlife more generally. Um, and this one, uh, we're just going to give you a kind of a broad overview of the Powerful Owl Project. So the Powerful Owl Project is um, not possible without the help of um, all our sponsors, um, but more importantly, the hundreds of volunteers who really drive this project. Um, I kind of coordinate things a little bit, but it really isn't possible without the involvement of hundreds of volunteers. Um, and, you know, first, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you what the heck a powerful owl was. It's this huge, beautiful bird. So I've got a tape measure here. And um, so that's how big a powerful owl is. It's huge. You know, 65 centimeters in size. And, um, you know, the, the female especially looks like she has a little head that got shrunk on a much bigger body. Um, so the, the head is almost disproportionately small. She's got a long, rounded tail, which you see in a lot of forest raptors. It helps birds kind of steer through the forest. Um, also bright yellow eyes, bright big feet, yellow feet. And these chevrons across the breast are something you don't see in um, many other owls. So a uh, very distinctive look about it. And again, huge bird occurs mostly in um, kind of east of the ranges, uh, the Great Dividing Range. And um, yeah, you don't get it very far west. And it's listed as vulnerable in Victoria, New South Wales, and here in Queensland. So it's one of the reasons we're concerned about this bird is it's recognized that its um, population has shrunk a lot um, in the last 50 years or so. Uh, that was a, a female powerful owl calling, very distinctive call, very, uh, the female's usually higher pitched and the male the male is usually much deeper. And um, a very distinctive, very owl sounding birds, you know, woo hoo is, is the noise they make. So, um, and it's the kind of thing that when you're walking around the forest, it makes you stop and go, whoa, you know, that's, that's something cool. That's a big bird. Um, and the chicks you'll see if you look on phonographic, you look for owl videos on, on there, you'll see just ridiculously cute chicks. So um, for all of those reasons, um, that makes powerful owl really attractive to the public. So the powerful owl is a bit of a flagship species. So when I give talks on little brown and gray birds, not very many people come along. Um, but when I give a powerful owl talk, last year I talked to over 1,400 people in Brisbane at a handful of workshops, 10, 12 workshops. People just um, love to hear about the powerful owl. And the great thing about that is we can then give stories about the powerful owl to the media and they're happy to run coverage of cute little owls. And we can piggyback messages on the back of that um, about the importance of retaining um, large tracts of forested land, about the importance of retaining hollow bearing trees. You know, these trees that are one to 500 years old um, that many of Australia's wildlife requires, um, including the powerful owl. So for that reason, it's really good at engagement. It engages a lot of volunteers. A lot of people are involved in the project and it engages the wider public. But remarkably, it also delivers really good data on a threatened species. You know, in New South Wales, they have several hundred places where they're monitoring par powerful owls, a threatened species, year in, year out. If you're at all statistically inclined, a sample size of in the hundreds 
for a threatened species is really, really useful. You can ask all kinds of questions with that data or answer all kinds of questions with that data. And if you have a powerful owl in your area, it tells you there's a lot of good things going on. Right? They're a bit of an umbrella species. They have really big home ranges. They require large tracts of forest. And they require large prey populations and a hollow-bearing tree to nest in, but a lot of their prey requires hollow-bearing trees. So if you have a powerful owl around, you've got a lot of good things going on. Um, there's some indication that they might also be um, an indicator species. You know, they indicate a variety of good things going on in the forest. So those are the main project aims. And, bird, you know, it's been one of BirdLife's most successful projects, probably. Uh, it was started in New South Wales. It's been running there for about 10 years. And it's only come to Brisbane in the last couple of years. But highly successful project. But here in Brisbane, every month we have they estimate, you know, about a thousand people moving to southeast Queensland every month. And when people move here, we've got to make decisions on where they're going to live, where are we going to build houses. Every month we're making decisions on what kinds of habitat we're going to conserve and what ki kinds of habitat are we going to get rid of. And surprisingly, powerful owl, despite being a huge bird, right, despite being very obvious, have this obvious woo-hoo call, we have no idea where they are in the landscape. And so this project seeks to both address figuring out where they are, but also what are the places in the landscape where they're doing better, where they're breeding but more, or um, uh, and what kinds of steps could we take to sort of increase this, their populations or better protect these birds. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at here in southeast Queensland. So far, um, you know, we had a pilot project in 2017, but the project really got, f got rolling in 2018. And so far we have, actually now we have 500 volunteers that are, that are signed up formally to the project. And as I said, we have given presentations like this to maybe 1,400 people last year. And we estimate that over 900 thousand people, almost a million people, were reached through the various media stories that came out about the project last year. So it's already ticking that engagement box in a really serious way. Um, so far in, in, uh, in Brisbane, we've only identified 12 nesting hollows. Now those nesting hollows are the places um, that land managers and planners are going to be most interested in. Those are the the places in most need of protection. Um, but we've identified 31 breeding pairs in the region, and again, th that signifies the area of most importance. We know generally where the birds are, we just don't know which individu individual tree they might have popped out from. And we estimate there's at least 50 active pairs, territorial pairs so far, um, or we're, we're actually confident that there's over 50 pairs. But we think, given the available data that's coming in, and it's quite a bit now, when we started this project, we thought there might be 25 to 50 powerful owls in southeast Queensland. We now think there might be you know, somewhere between 150 and 300 pairs of territorial breeding owls in southeast Queensland. And that picture has just come together in a very short time. One of the other um, interesting things that comes out of this project is they seem to be breeding really well in the cities. That's true in New South Wales and it's true here. They're producing, you know, uh, here last year on average 1.3 chicks per nesting hollow. That's enough birds to replenish the population. Those birds in the cities are not reliant on birds coming to the cities from the outer forests to sustain their population. They're recruiting enough birds to sustain that population. Um, it's a source population, not a sink population, based at least on recruitment. We'll talk a 
in another video about some of the things we're worried about in the cities, but they certainly do seem to be reproducing well in a lot of areas. Uh, one of the amazing things about the Powerful Owl project is uh, somebody who coordinates the project, like me, can almost never pick exactly um, what's going to come out of it. And that's because the people who get involved um, start up individual projects of their own. Um, you can go online to the Powerful Owl website and download material that is suitable for um, the national curriculum in schools and teach people about Powerful Owls, all because some teachers got involved with the project and started producing those materials. Um, you've got people who are advocating for owls in local areas, and we've got a number of research projects that I'll talk about in other videos, but um, that have sprung up um, because all of a sudden there's all this data available to look at powerful owls. So some really cool things emerge from the project. Um, and one of the other interesting things about powerful owls is if you had asked me 20, 30 years ago, where do powerful owls occur in Queensland? I would have told you, well, they're in those old majestic forests in, in the ranges. You know, those old growth forests where they're the kinds of places you picture elves and um, dwarves walking around the forest floor, you know? I mean, just magical big forests. But in the last 10 to 20 years, they've been moving into the cities increasingly. So now powerful owls are in, um, in the Botanic Gardens in Sydney, in this scrubby habitat around Sud Sydney Harbor. So they're showing up in all kinds of places that we didn't typically think of as powerful owl habitat just a couple of decades ago. If you do adopt a powerful owl territory, you've got about a 50% chance that those cute little chicks are going to emerge out of that tree, right? So breeding success is about 50%. About half the time they produce young. Uh, when they try to, to reproduce. And the reason we don't have as many powerful owls as we might have is because of the loss of these big old trees. Um, usually a powerful owl tree is still going to have a bit of um, leaves in the canopy, uh, but it also is going to have a big hole in it, you know, 35 centimeter hole um, that the birds use um, to enter uh, into that tree and to breed in. Um, they're usually, these breeding trees are usually in areas of denser vegetation. It's usually not that lone tree out on the golf course. It's usually in with other trees, maybe on the golf course, but not usually that lone tree by itself. Um, and 85 centimeters DBH, which is, you know, quite a substantial tree. You know, quite big um, at a minimum. And sometimes they get much, much, much larger than that. So a powerful owl hollow, um, the cliche powerful owl hollow looks a lot like a uh, Winnie the Pooh hollow, you know, just a window in a tree. And sometimes that hollow is anywhere from a meter to two meters deep inside that tree. But sometimes you'll see them in these chimney tops. So, you know, a dead top tree that's, you know, a bit like a chimney and the birds will just drop in. Um, and sometimes you'll see them in sort of these dead branches. Uh, so this was a powerful owl hollow that was used that a cockatoo moved into um, two days after the powerful owls had left. So owls are in kind of, or hollows, I'm sorry, are in, are in uh, or shor short supply, right? It's probably the thing that's limiting powerful owl populations the most. And sometimes when they get desperate, you'll see them in a really small, hollow like this. That's probably about the smallest hollow um, we've seen them in so far. Generally much larger than that. Uh, they tend to be both um, breeding and roosting in denser bits of the forest. And often those bits of the forest that are a little bit cooler when you're walking through them is where you're going to find powerful owls. And one of the reasons we think they might be using dense uh, forest is this is a powerful owl that is um, was a little over-optimistic um, 
and ended up on the ground when it first tried to fly. And often this, they'll stay on the ground for a couple of days. Um, but if there's dense vegetation around the nesting tree, they'll be able to climb back up into the canopy. So we think that might be one reason adults are selecting areas with dense vegetation, because it allows the chicks more places to hang out after they pop up. Uh, the project's also increasingly engaging a variety of stakeholders. Um, most all the stakeholders agree that if we can predict where powerful owls occur in the landscape accurately without having to visit every single place where powerful owls might be, um, so that's what you can do with a species distribution model. If you can develop a good one of those, that would be a good step in the right direction. Some more standardized survey guidelines and management guidelines. These guys are not on the planning radar in a very meaningful way. And um, part of that comes down to inadequate survey effort. Uh, they are very hard to find. You have to put a lot of effort in to find one if it is there. Um, other things that we've talked about are, you know, could we develop uh, an essential habitat layer or a state trigger map? These are um, things that work for other species. Maybe we could develop something like that for powerful owl. Um, if you're in Brisbane City Council, or there's a few other councils that do this, you can nominate a vegetation protection order, a VPO. You can do that online. You can do that yourself. So if you see this magnificent old tree with tons of hollows in it, you can um, designate it as a VPO. That doesn't necessarily guarantee it's going to be protected for forever, but it will be on the planning radar, and it'll increase the likelihood um, that it'll be protected. So there's some things you could do, both within council and state planning schemes. And I guess the, the thing I want to stress about the Powerful Owl Project, anybody can participate. Um, you know, anybody can hear a a woo-hoo call, right? It's a very distinctive owl call, and it's a huge bird. You're not going to miss it when you go out um, if it's um, down low. They are hard to find, though. Um, but by having hundreds of people helping us listen and look for them, we're able to figure out where they are. But I'd really encourage you, so anybody can submit a record. You don't have to sign up formally, but I'd encourage you to sign up formally because that allows us to spread the effort a little bit more. Um, everybody would be going to a handful of places if we didn't coordinate the effort a bit. Um, it allows us to keep the land managers and property owners happy um, by following the rules that they want us to abide by. And it minimizes risks both to the owls and to people. If there are too many people visiting a, territor a territory, um, you can uh, have poor breeding success as a result, or you can um, have the owls get aggressive and start swooping at people, which can cause a bit of pain. So those are things we want to avoid. Uh, so I hope you tune in to our other videos, and uh, no matter what, I hope you get involved uh, in some way with the Powerful Owl Project. Thank you.